keep your radio right here at 1350 AM and 103.9 FM, or keep us on your phone with the Veritas mobile app. You can get the app at the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, or VeritasCatholic.com. And Let Me Be Frank is brought to you by a grant from Foundations in Faith. Foundations in Faith embraces innovative approaches to funding pastoral care programs in the Diocese of Bridgeport. Resources focus on energizing lifelong faith formation and discipleship and fostering a commitment to justice and accompaniment with our most vulnerable. From seminarians to retired priests, from baptism to last rites, from suburbs to inner cities, the reach is broad, the impact is meaningful. For more information, visit them on the web at foundationsinfaith.org. Okay, here we go. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. I'm Steve Lee, and it is my pleasure as always to introduce Bishop Frank Caggiano. Steve, it's good to see you. Excellency, always. Yes, as always, it's good to see you. So I wanted to, before I introduce uh, our guest for this week, Excellency, I wanted to know, have you ever played this game, Two Truths and a Lie? No. Okay. So I was inspired to do this because when I asked our guest for a bio... Um, I got three versions. So So I figured figured I would would... play with you, Excellency, two truths and a lie. So this is where someone tells three things about themselves. You have to figure out which one is the lie because the others two are true. Okay, Okay. let's hear. Okay, Okay. here's bio number one. So our our guest, by the way, so excited is Dr. Peter Kraft of Boston College. So here's bio number one. Dr. Kraft was born, is living, and will die. (laughs) <laughs> okay. All right. Bio number two. Dr. Kraft is an extraterrestrial alien who was deposited on the wrong planet when his flying saucers GPS malfunctioned, and he is now trying to follow ET to home. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and bio number three. Dr. Kraft is a professor of philosophy at my alma mater, Boston College, and uh, as I told him, I'm sad to say that in my four years there, I was too much of a knucklehead to have known to go take one of his classes. But here's the rest of bio number three. Dr. Kraft has written over 100 books, including Handbook wow. of Christian Apologetics, Christianity for Modern Pagans, Fundamentals of the Faith, and his latest, Socrates' Children, which is a walk through the 100 greatest philosophers of all time written for philosophy beginners. And Dr. Kraft loves his five grandchildren, four children, one wife, one cat, and one God. Amen. Okay, truth, lie, truth. Easy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I guess we'll find out. Dr. Peter Kraft, thank you so much. It's a pleasure and honor to have you join us on Let Me Be Frank. Well, it's an honor to be here. I can't say it's a pleasure because uh, my internet connection, according to the screen, is unstable, and every third word has been deleted so far, so I'm trying to follow you as best I can. But that happens. The digital demons are having their day. Uh, Doctor, have you had in your office up in Boston? No, I'm at home. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that's happened before. In fact, we've lost tapings steve and i have had that they've so let's pray that the angel of technology will come and, and get us to noontime right <laughs> yes. well well listen i peter i am delighted that you are here all right because you are a remarkable apologetist apologist for our contemporary age right precisely because in many ways you have helped to you have helped even me in many ways to rethink some of the very basic premises we live under that are being said to us and sold to us. And it's, it's, that's some of what I want to get kind of explore with you today, because you gave a commencement speech at Franciscan university that I thought was just brilliant about the 10 lies that no one else will ever tell you that I'm about to uh, tell you as graduate. I thought it was just brilliantly done. Just, and we'll talk about that in a little while. But let's well, talk- it was it was it was good, but it wasn't brilliant precisely because it, it it didn't share these these scholarly abstractions. But it was simple common sense. It was exactly and, and well, today common sense is the most uncommon thing in the world. A- amen. That's exactly the point. And unfortunately, it has a profound impact on how we pass on the faith, how one receives the faith, and embraces the faith. Right. That's ultimately 
right? That's that's why I say you're an apologist because it, it, we, Steve and I have talk, spoken often about apologetics and, and in a sense, people understand that as militantly defending the faith. But the truth is the faith doesn't need to be militantly defended. There's a beauty, coherence, logic, a comprehensiveness about it, but you have to be able to receive it. And a lot of the static, what I call the potholes of life have to be filled in first. And then it's just, it's naturally received. Is that a fair way of putting it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, God is his own best trumpeter. Yeah, right. So some of I want to explore some of that with you today. But but I've always asked my guests to talk about their own personal journey of faith. What what has your journey been like all these years? Well, I was born and brought up in an evangelical Protestant Calvinist environment. Uh, and I respected all the people there and still love them very much. And I learned the basic gospel and I learned who Jesus was and I learned to love him and trust him. Very grateful to them. At Calvin College, uh, I started to explore things Catholic. Uh, I thought it was a temptation and they made more sense, both their truth, uh, their rationality and their goodness, their saints and their beauty, the, the liturgy of the great Catholic tradition. Uh, so I took a course in church history I tried to prove to myself that the Catholic Church went bad, that is, pagan in the Middle Ages, uh, and that there was some sort of a break between the simple gospel that I believed and this big thing that was the Catholic Church. And I found that it was exactly the opposite, a seamless web of continuity. Uh, so it was basically Newman's path. Uh, Newman says uh, the, the most dangerous, something like the most dangerous book the Protestant can read of the Church Father. Mm -hmm. Young Catholic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Eucharist simply blew me away. Not a single Christian in the world doubted the real presence or endured tours, and then he uh, abjured his heresy for 1,500 years. Mm -hmm. I said mm -hmm. to myself, well, if we Protestants are right and Catholics are wrong about that, uh, well, how would, how would the Holy Spirit let everybody in the church uh, be such ridiculous idolaters that they're bowing down to bread and worshiping wine, confusing it with Almighty God? That makes no sense. Right, right, right. That's that's fascinating. So would you say it was an intellectual journey at the beginning? Like an into It was an intellectual journey. It was also a personal journey because after my mind was convinced, uh, like Augustine, my will was simply holding back. Uh, we intellectuals are good at procrastinating. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, he's just stretched out a hand from the ark and hold me aboard. Mm-hmm. And then you became a Catholic when then? Uh, February 2nd, 1960 at Yale University. Oh, was that right? Yes. Oh, wow. The Feast of the Presentation. Wow. <laughs> it, was the, it was the Feast of uh, St. Justin Martyr. Oh, in those days. With yes. my chosen patron. Yes. Was, yes. Yeah, the Feast of the yeah, true. That's right. The Feast of Moon with the, with the renewal. I hear you're from Brooklyn. You'd like this story. Uh, yes, I arrived please. on campus convinced that I wanted to become a Catholic. So I, I knocked on the uh, rectory door uh, in the morning and a priest came down uh, in his nightshirt. I had awakened him uh, and he smiled. I wanted to become a Catholic. And he said, that's nice. So who's the girl? <laughs> he, he was very practical. He was from Brooklyn. Oh, there you graduated go. Graduated 101st in a class of 101 seminarians. Oh. Very simple mind. <laughs> I would come to him with questions from the Summa Theologic, and he said, let's start with the Penny Catechism. <laughs> and it was exactly what I needed. Oh, my God. Oh, isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? Now, you've taught at Boston College how long? I think it was since the Jurassic Age. I noticed some dinosaur <laughs> footprints in the backyard. Uh, I started there in 65. I taught at Villanova for three years from 62 through. So you must be the long, the longest serving professor at Boston Boston College, I, I would think. I think so. I think so. Yeah. I don't put much stock in numbers, so. Yeah, but I do have a, a question. I'm just curious. Uh, much has changed all those years, particularly among young people and what they come, what they bring, their interests. As you look at this odyssey, now that's basically a couple of generations. What's, what's your takeaway as the state of young people vis-a-vis -vis faith, vis-a-vis -vis involvement in the things of faith? What what have you seen all these years for better and what concerns you for worse, if I could put it that way? Well, the students in the 60s were self-conscious rebels uh, and they were all often rebelling in the wrong direction, but at least they knew who they were and what they wanted. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they had some sense of history. They had some sense of logic. Uh, and today, that's pretty much all ideologized. Uh, the notion that there is objective truth and that we can know it is held by a minority today. Rather than a minority. I think that uh, the main thing is blown away. The great synthesis of faith and reason is dead largely because reason is dying. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, what the, the, simple, the, the simple notion that your thought has to conform to objective reality uh, is to many students a, a anathema. That's huh. an insult. So that's one of the basic premises that we need to challenge, right? If we're going to allow the passing on of the faith to be effective, right? Yes, and it's kind of tricky to challenge it uh, because it, it can't be proved. It has to be assumed. You know, there is objective truth. Well, I doubt that. Uh, oh, well, then uh, you're contradicting yourself because you're saying it's an objective truth that there's no objective truth. Yes, I am contradicting myself. So what? The law of non-contradiction is a plot invented by dead white European heterosexual pious males to suppress the minds of, uh, uh, of the unorthodox. What do you do with that? Well, that's a good question. It, what do you do with that? You pray. Uh, you you try to exercise the demon before you argue with it. Mm -hmm. He is, I think, the most radical philosopher in the world because he's the first one who challenged what he called the will to truth. He said, no, all philosophers before me have disagreed about what the truth is, but they all assumed that we wanted truth. Why truth? Suppose life contradicts truth, then the hell with truth. Up with the lie. Right. So it's relativism, subjectivism, taking to its ultimate conclusion in a way. Yes. And that's at the at the heart of uh, of the transgender movement and, and of uh, uh, active you know, gay activism. Uh, I will be what I want to be, not what nature, objective truth, or God wants me to be. Right. I am right. God. I mean, the, right. uh, they often still believe in God. They say, "God, you have to move out of my seat. I'm I'm in the driver's seat here." Oh, so it's the old adage: "We're not made in God's image. God is made in our image." Exactly. Exactly. Right. Right, right. So in a sense, is there, but now you, you raised one of many points that hopefully we could cover while we're together is that, that people now of all ages, not just young people, are comfortable with an inherent contradiction. That is, they act as if there is an objective truth, even if what's, but they don't acknowledge it cognitively, right? And, and so, and they're comfortable living in a disconnect that way. Right. Well, they're living in two worlds. They still believe in objective truth in the world of science. Anything that is empirical and uh, mm -hmm. mathematical, uh, mm -hmm. there's still objective truth there. But if it has anything to do with values or meaning or wisdom, that's purely subjective. Yeah. We're the first society in history to deny that there is anything like an objective moral law. Right. So, so the concept of the what truth is and that it's multivalent and that it is more than just empirical, that is what's being attacked, right? Yes, yes. Right. Okay. You know, I, I'm going and to- And that's why philosophy is so important. You get into the pre-modern philosophers, you, right. you, you see, you, rather than simply, you, you, you actually get into the mind of someone who practiced that belief in objective truth, and you see how beautiful it is, compared right. with the ideologized, subjectivized, relativized moderns. Right, right. Uh, I have once had a conversation in a high school class, and I, I'm going to narrate it for you in, in, in broad strokes. And I want you to critique it because it could very well have been, you know, um, I it may have been futile. But when we spoke about truth, right, and they readily, as you say, before they come to you in the co collegiate life, even in high school, they very readily admit that um science gives us facts that you just got to deal with, right? Math gives us facts. One plus one is two. And they also readily admit when they're brutally honest that they kind of see religion as the myth that's going to last for as long as science needs to catch up, right? And then it may all disappear or whatever. Okay, so having said all that. So I said, okay, that's, you know, that's what you hold. All right, so now let me ask you a question I said. Do you who do you love in your life? Oh, I love my mom, my dad, my this, that, the other. And I said, okay. So if you were to say, I love my father, is that true? I told him. I asked him. 
And they kind of look at me, you know, and one girl in particular said, well, yeah, it's true. I said, but then by the basis of what you just said, how can you actually tell me that's true? Why is that not just a fabricated opinion or something? And they kind of look at me and they're kind of at a loss. And, and I say to myself, do you realize truth is more than just the fact, right? Truth c- comes in many different ways. Now, the class ended soon after that. I've never really had the opportunity to go back to the class. But is that, what's your reaction as a, as a teacher, as a philosopher, as a apologist? How do we kind of break through that kind of? You just did. You gave an example of your breaking through that. The traditional approach is live and love according to reason. And that worked for a while. But since reason is broken down, uh, the approach that works best now is the opposite. Start with love. Is love the supreme value? Yes. Okay. Now, does love go all the way up? Or is it just how you feel? And if you feel hate instead of love, that's the meaning of life, right? No, 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 no. Haters like Hitler, they're wrong. And lovers like me, we're right. Oh, well, then love must be not just what you personally prefer. But it must be the ultimate meaning of ultimate reality. So God must be love. There must be a, a, a real perfect love that you're striving for. And they're impressed by that argument. They've never heard an argument like that before. Right, right, right. Exactly. Because the world's going to is not going to give them the venue to hear it. We have to give them the venue to hear it. Right. And that's why saints will convert the world. Because they are living examples of love. Right. The right. of it. Right. Right. They did it once in the first two centuries. Right. right. I mean, think of think of these practical, hard nosed scientific Romans uh, who saw Christians risking their lives to save people from the plague when nobody else would do it, and giving their enemies when they were slaughtered in the Colosseum, uh, and going to the to the next life singing hymns. Uh, either these people are crazy, or they have something that has never been seen before. That right. that was right. you can't argue with the saint. Nobody ever won an argument with Mother Teresa. Oh, oh, without a doubt. Oh, uh, exactly, exactly. Who was the who was the famous atheist who took on Mother Teresa? I forget his name now. Christopher oh, Hitchens. Yeah, the guy Christopher Hitchens. Yes, Christopher. Yeah, yeah. and and, and he, he told her he told her names that can't be pronounced uh, legally. Uh, yes, on public media. Yeah. Right, exactly. But in the end, um, I have difficulty remembering his name, but everybody knows who Mother Teresa is. In the end, <laughs> yes, right. Yes. Is it that? There was another famous atheist, a very intelligent atheist, Malcolm Muggeridge, who became a Christian, but not a Catholic for a long time. And he said, uh, the reason I'm a Catholic is uh, three words from Mother Teresa's mouth. Teresa said to him once, Malcolm, you're a good man. Why don't you see your way all the way uh, to swim the Tiber and become a Catholic? Uh, Malcolm said, uh, I said to uh, Mother Teresa, well, I'll, I'll refute you with your own words, Mother. God is probably looking down at the two of us right now, one a Protestant. And they're either Catholic Christian, and he's saying, "Well, I'm I'm glad I have some Christians outside of my church too. I need that." And Mother Teresa said, "No, he doesn't." <laughs> I couldn't answer that, <laughs> so I became a Catholic. Oh, I love it! I love it! I love it! It's so much fun being Catholic, really, honestly. <laughs> it's, it's like it's like shooting ducks in a barrel. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, one of the things I wanted to pick your brain about is in this in this you know we talk about apologetics and, and the importance of philosophy and helping people to understand why it is important to ask some of these more ultimate questions right in seminary formation many a seminarian will say well do i mean what's the point about philosophy hey, in the end we could isn't it about the faith isn't it about the creed isn't it about the catechism uh, why do I have to study this? And you could ex- extrapolate that to anybody. You know, why do I have to know about epistemology or metaphysics or, you know, modern philosophy? What's your response as a philosopher to all of that? Well, uh, the first three quarters of what you say disappeared into cyberspace. So oh. I'm not sure what uh, the question is other than why study philosophy. Yeah, well, basically, that it's basically to that. Yeah. Why study well, philosophy? Because everybody has a philosophy. That's it or explicit. And if you say the hell with philosophy, that's your philosophy. It's that philosophy. Mm-hmm. Philosophy is not just the cultivation of cleverness or the sophistication of scholarship. It's the love of wisdom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And deep down, we all want to be wise rather than fools. Mm-hmm. So philosophy is is like food. It's natural. Mm-hmm. 
not that any particular philosophical system is for us, but the philosophical question, uh, does life have a meaning? How can I find my true identity? Uh, what are the true values in life? Those are questions that everybody asks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the starting point. The hu human nature was not invented at Harvard or Hollywood. It was invented in heaven. So Amen. we've got a good point. Amen. The other thing I think, if I may, again, please, please critique. But when people speak about meaning, right, in the end, like the, the, the great atheists, the philosophers, they thought there was a value to propagate their ideas. Well, if everything is absolutely absurd, then that act is absurd too. Like why even get out of bed? Why even bother, right, in the end, if, if everything is relative? So they act in a opposition to what they're proposing, in a sense. So I, I say that because I hear many people who say, well, it's meaning for me, but but that doesn't have lasting value, right? No, no. It's, right? So you act as if you are pursuing a greater meaning or an eternal meaning, even though you think it's a transitory meaning. Is that is that a fair estimate? Yes, it is. And that doesn't bother most atheists because they don't work by logic. They don't assume that uh, the law of non-contradiction is true. They work by their feelings. They're sophisticated versions of the uh, the average sheepish person in Western civilization who thinks that uh, uh, psychology is the most important science and feelings are the most important thing in psychology, and you have to be true to your feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, all the saints, uh, w when I started to read the Catholic saints, I was scandalized or really scandalized, but surprised and almost delighted by the fact that they all said feelings are much less important than you think. Love is a choice. It's an act of will. It's free. If feelings come along, want fine. If they don't, fine too. Without a doubt, that, well, that, you know, that shocks students more than almost anything else you can say today. You know, it's it's it is one of the the one of the of the um, the lessons I learned in fundamental theology when I studied at the Immaculate Conception Seminary on Long Island. That just like you said, shocked me when I heard it for the first time. Because I too came to seminary formation with a lot of the potholes that were not filled in yet, right? Typical of my age at yeah. the time. I went to the seminary in 1983. So, I mean, this was, and when Dennis Regan, God rest his soul, Monsignor, who just died, right, a week ago, said, love is effectively willing the good of the other for the sake of the other. I thought to mm -hmm. myself, oh my gosh. So it has nothing to necessarily has nothing to do with like feeling anything towards the person. It's the act. Of, that's why loving your neighbor is possible. Yes. And loving your enemy is possible, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Feelings, feelings come and go. They're, they're wonderful. They're beautiful. They're fun. Sometimes they're terrifying, but they're like surf. It, it, mm -hmm. It's fun to swim in the surf, but you can't build a house on the surf. Right. Right. It's well, not the foundation for life. Yeah, it's an excellent image. Excellent image. Yeah, so I think, so in the end, for us as Christians, um, we say we believe in the Judeo-Christian tradition, of course, and for ourselves as Christians, that we're made in the image and likeness of God. So what does that mean in the concrete for us? Like, what's our takeaway from saying we're made in the image and likeness of God? Looking at our experience, what, is, what does it say about who God is? It says that if you find the complete human being, you find the best window to God. So even on a humanist Christian basis, almost everybody agrees that Jesus was a complete human being. Uh, that's our best window to God. Is it that interesting? Jesus says, no man has seen God at any time. Only The only begotten son has revealed him. Uh, wow. And, and, and that's much more concrete than any other religion. Here is God in the flesh. Want to see what God is like? There's no more beyond Jesus. Uh, in Paul's letter to the Colossians, as this verse, uh, the fullness of divinity uh, was pleased to dwell in him. Mm -hmm. People think there's got to be something more in God the Father than God the Son. There's got to be something God's holding back and not showing up. Jesus. And the answer is no. He is. That's it. Right. And that's, and that's the total love that he poured out on the cross. 
I could have saved the world by his circumcision. One drop of the, of the precious blood would have told mm-hmm. all of your sins. Why did he give us 12 pints of it? Because he had 12 pints of those. It was right. Well, that's, that's beautifully said. Very beautifully said. And therefore, the tying of our love for God and our love for neighbor is, is precisely two sides of one coin for that reason. Yeah, we love our neighbor because they're God's kids. So are we. Exactly. Right. We love those whom God loves. Yeah. 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 And in that sense, Christianity is 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 critiqued by the modern world as being this complicated set of rules and regulations and all the people created. All, but it, it is as simple as you just described. It is. That's why the Bible is such an amazing book. It's so complex that theologians argue about it forever. It's so simple that a child can understand it. Right. Right. Wow. Tremendous. Tremendous. I think we're, we're coming up to a break. When we come back from the break, Peter, uh, that uh, I hope you remember that commencement address you gave a Franciscan, because some of the insights you made, I think our listeners would benefit phenomenally if you could raise some of those points, some of the the misconceptions that people live by and how well, we have to expose them. Well, sure, I am absolutely a professor, and I'll probably forget nine of them, but not all ten. But <laughs> even if you have one, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you can hear that when we come back. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. His Excellency is speaking with Dr. Peter Kraft, author, speaker, uh, potential extraterrestrial, and um, <laughs> professor of philosophy at Boston College. Be right back. If you're concerned about your end-of-life plans, searching for a Catholic cemetery, or have loved ones who are buried in one of the 14 Catholic cemeteries throughout Fairfield County, now might be a good time to begin planning for yourself or for other family members. Call one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 to leave a message or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Many people don't realize that they can be buried with their deceased loved ones, even if all of the family's in-ground plots have been taken. The Diocese of Bridgeport Catholic Cemeteries provides in-ground burials, as well as columbarium and mausoleum options. This makes it possible to unite your family together in the same cemetery, and it's an opportunity to build a bridge for your family back to the church. Talking about this issue is not easy, but pre-need planning makes your wishes clear, reduces cost, and helps your family avoid difficult decisions at a time of grief and loss. You can start your planning now by contacting one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. We can guide you through the options, regulations, and considerations to help you make the best decisions for your family. The number is 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Uh, Bishop Frank Caggiano is here with the excellent Dr. Peter Kraft. Bishop. Yeah, so Peter, uh, again, going back to the commencement address, and quite frankly, beyond that, because this you have been teaching this for many, many, many years. You know, what are some of the the the, the maxims? You know, the what, what's considered to be the common sense of the modern world that people just accept blindly, that are a recipe for confusion or worse, right? Give us an example or two of what that could look like. The number one example, I think, is what is said in most commencement speakers with the graduates. You can be whatever you want to be. That is a simple, literal, outright lie. But people love that lie. Now, I'm going to say something very controversial. That's the lie at the heart of the transgender movement. And there, the relativism penetrates even science. Science tells us that in every cell of our body, we are either masculine or feminine. Science tells us that that is the objective fact of nature. And now it has become not only popular, but uh, 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 to approve the lie that you are whatever you want to be. Uh, I got in trouble once uh, with the authorities at Boston College who were very reasonable, and I have no critique of them. I love DC, it's a good place to work. But a transgender student acted uh, to my, uh, I didn't know he was transgender at the time. We were talking about ethics, and I thought that. Uh, 
uh, the idea that you could be whatever you wanted to be uh, sexually as well as uh, every other way uh, was literally insane. I defined insanity as the refusal to conform to objective reality. I complained and I had to apologize to him because I hurt his feelings. And, but but there's, there's objective truth involved here and science is on my side, not on his side. Matter, you heard his feeling what counts. I did apologize. And mm -hmm. that, that's an example of uh, uh, how far this relativism can extend. Right. Our subjective feelings are the standard of objective truth. It, 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 is it also fair to say with this idea you could be anything you want to be is also usurping God's role? Of course, you can be God. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You can you can create your own values. That's another uh, cliche that's become popular. Mm -hmm. Well, if you create your own values, they're not values at all because values are things that are superior to you. You want to conform to them. Mm -hmm. But if they simply come for you, or they're just the rules of the game, well, you can change the rules of the game if you made them. Right. If there's a bunch of kids that want to play baseball and they say, let's play nine innings, and after six innings they get tired, they can change the rules and go home. No problem. Mm-hmm. So if the rules and the values come from us, they're not, they don't have any force. They're not oughts. They're simply what you feel. Right. You know, there was a saying when we were growing up in Brooklyn, and that is whoever makes the rules wins the game. But it, what we're describing, if you make the rules, there is no game to play in the end. Yeah. Yeah. It, somebody else has to make the rules. Right. Somebody else has to put down the finish line. Then and only then can you progress towards that finish line. Right. But if you create the finish line, mm -hmm. progress is impossible. Right. Imagine imagine a runner on first base trying to steal second base. As long as he leaves first base, the second baseman rips the second base bag from the uh, the ground and runs with it towards third. <laughs> the runner will never get that stolen base. No, we would have done that in Brooklyn, though, just for the record. I mean, yeah, right. we would have done that. <laughs> well, we're doing it now in academia. <laughs> well, see, so that's an excellent example. Are there any others that cross your mind? Common, you know, kind of pr pr proposed. Everything, well, the idea, the idea that everything changes, that everything is negotiable. Is that negotiable? Does that change? Ah, ah, excellent point. But I find that the other side, if I may use that military language, is unimpressed by that because that, in, that assumes that there is objective truth. There isn't. We make all the rules, including the rules of logic. And mm -hmm. so what? Do I contradict myself? Fine. I'm large. I contain right. myself. Right. Right. You know, may I just uh, offer this observation, too, because I'm curious what your reaction is. S Steve and I, about, I don't know, six, seven months ago, um, I spoke about my love of astronomy mm. and the James Webb Sp Space Telescope. And some of what is revealing uh, is first of all, it's it's magnificent as to what the human intellect, when it really applies itself, now can do. Yeah. But it's forcing limit concepts even within science itself. Yep. So the fact that there is a portion of the universe that will forever, forever, be unattainable to humanity simply because there is no way to be able to travel to it or have light come to us from it since 96 billion light years ago, and how young people who are now ex being exposed to this are having existential crises. Because yeah. even within the world of science, there are limits now that they cannot penetrate. So yeah. speak to that. Is that an opening for us, apologetic? It is. It is. Uh, you can start with science. You can start with aesthetics. You can start with history. Uh, everything is an opening for us. But the... Uh, uh, the practicing successful scientist today almost always has a basically religious sense. There's something out there that is greater than him that has to be discovered rather than created. Mm. So science is on our side. Mm. Uh, the the so-called war between science and religion, which is the standard view of modern history and the standard explanation for why religion is declining, is an absolute and simple lie. Not a single religious doctrine has ever been refuted by a single scientific discovery at any time, in any place. Interesting. So if somebody well, says science. science versus religion, which science, which discovery, which religious doctrine? Yeah. And they so Peter, what about psychiatry and psychology? Are they are, are they allies in this for us or are do, can they have a role to play to bridge this gap that we're talking about? Yes, if they're honest, but uh, 
psychologists and psychiatrists are uh, the, I don't know of all the professions, uh, it's one of the professions with the, the vastest majority of atheists. Really? Oh, yeah. And most uh, most psychiatrists or atheists say they encourage religion in their clients because it gives them a sense of peace and, and, and helps them. And they see that on the practical level, religion works, but they don't see on the theoretical level that it could possibly be true. Oh, so they're actually suggesting it simply as a tool, as a, oh, yeah. as a coping mechanism, but not because they believe it necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I'm not I'm not belittling the science of psych psychology uh, by any means, but uh, uh, ordinary things like depression, uh, scientific studies have shown over and over again that bartenders are as effective as psychologists. Really, or, ordinary psychotherapy for ordinary problems uh, are not dealt with effectively, very effectively by by psychologists. That doesn't mean they can't be. And that doesn't mean that, that that things like couples counseling is worthless. It's certainly very worthwhile. Right. Uh, but the success rate is is very small, disappointingly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's interesting. I, I stumbled on a uh, an article not long ago about the, the importance of friendship. Yes. And how friendship is wired, obviously, into our nature. And those who are struggling with friendship necessarily have some of the consequences, you know, of loneliness and depression, and that we're in a crisis of friendship in mm -hmm. the last 20 years among men, because when in 1990, 3% of men said they did not have a single close friend. Now in the latest survey, 15% of all men will say they have not a single close friend. Yes. And, and I thought to myself, reading, of course, it's alarming, but it's another consequence of being made in the image and likeness of God, because God is one, but he's also a community. Yes, yes. Well, the statistics on teenage uh, loneliness and depression are astonishing. Mm -hmm. The latest statistic I saw was 59% of teenagers experience significant uh, times of clinical depression. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, the temptation to suicide, which used to be something between five and ten percent, now is approaching half. Half of all teenagers seriously contemplate suicide. Time. Really? Uh, that's that's disaster. Oh my gosh, I had no idea it was that severe. Wow, disaster. Wow. But you know what? It may just be a consequence of everything we're speaking about. Allow me this analysis, right? And again, please critique it. Um. My experience with young people has always been if if you you are, are able to inspire them and give them something to strive for, they will try to strive for it. Yes. There is something in the human spirit that says, I want to strive for this. That's why we still have young people going into the military, going into the Marines, special forces. They need to aspire. Okay. So if there isn't an objectivity, if there isn't something that says you should strive for this virtuous life or this, then you're robbing them of that which could avoid otherwise an existence that's a well, what difference does it make then? Yeah, yeah. And that feeds into what you're talking about. Is that fair, an analysis? It's, it's not only fair, it's very profound. Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning discovered in Auschwitz, the uh, main reason for survival was not health, was not uh, being treated well by the by their captors, it was. Did you have a sense of meaning, a purpose? Uh, he likes to quote a, a sentence from Nietzsche. Nietzsche is a wonderful mixture of of brilliance and and darkness. But here's a here's a brilliant statement. One can endure almost any how if only they have a why. Uh. In other words, no matter how bad life gets, and no matter how how severe the suffering and the challenge, if it's meaningful, you can do it. If it's not meaningful, if it's only your little game, uh, you give up in despair. Yeah, yeah. So one of the one of the great challenges for for Catholicism in this this point in our history is to be able to effectively bring people to the conclusion that the premises modern life is built on, this relativism, subjectivism, all this stuff, is in fact a large contributor 
to what they're seeing in the children they love and how they're struggling with what they're struggling with. They are connected intimately. That's why the idealization of our thought is so dangerous. Uh, when the passion that used to be directed towards religious truth dies, it doesn't die entirely, it just directs itself to another uh, area, and that area is usually politics. I find that most Catholics I know are more passionate about their politics than about their religion. Mm. You know, you are, you are either, uh, you either think Donald Trump is, is God or Adolf Hitler, and mm -hmm. you think that one of the two parties is the party of the devil and the other is the party of God. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that can't last. All, all fundamental errors are self-destructive. Uh, it may bring down a lot of people and a lot of Western civilization with it, but it, but it, it, it can't possibly succeed. Right. right. Evil, evil can't possibly rival the good any more than, than darkness can rival the light. Mm -hmm. So all we have to do is shine the light and be patient, and eventually it's going to win. Mm -hmm. So if I were a 15-year-old and I said to you, Professor, what, what is evil? How would you define evil for me? Evil is indefinable. Evil is formlessness. Uh, good is a kind of, of order, especially an order in values. Mm -hmm. uh, and if all order breaks down and the second work of God after creating the universe, namely the Holy Spirit working on that water, that disordered, that formless chaos to bring order into it. Uh, once that is broken down, back to, to zero. And that's what's already happening with the family, with sexuality. There's a man, what is a woman? It doesn't matter. They're changeable. Uh, mm -hmm. What is good? What is evil? It doesn't matter. They're all relative. What is truth? What is falsehood? It doesn't matter. It all comes out of your own mind. That's the fundamental breakdown of divinely created order. And right. the devil's very clever strategy. Right. See, I, I admire you because you, you speak about the, the, the presence of the evil one very clearly in a lot of what you talk about. And I think young people must be sh kind of shocked when they hear that from you. No? Well, like we, we know by experience that life is warfare. Life is a struggle at least spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, what the relation between that and physical warfare is, is somewhat controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I have sympathy for both the militarist and the pacifist, but uh, people tend to go into the military today uh, for different reasons than they used to be. It used to be that they assumed that there was order and value, and this was a good one, and the country is worth defending, so let's risk our lives for our buddies. Okay. That's no longer the, the, the usual reason. The usual reason today, I think, is I can't find meaning anywhere else. These people are offering me a way uh, that distinguishes between good and evil. And I need that. Right. Right. You know, in my confirmation homily, I, I've added, a, well, it, it's evolved over the years and there are many different forms of it. But I, I at somewhat, I made the decision that I'm going to address one issue in particular with these young people. I want you to, to respond. Right? And I say to them that you're growing up in a world where your first mistake could conceivably be your last mistake because the world will not forgive it. It will seek to just eradicate, cancel you out. I said, but you are coming, you're standing with a Lord who if you're willing to seek forgiveness, your, your, your first mistake need not be the end, right? And that there is mercy and forgiveness. And they kind of look at me. I'll not forget it. Two weeks ago, I had a confirmation and one of the girls was actually crying. There was like a tear coming down her face mm -hmm. because there must be in her own life, those who are trying to cancel her out, mm -hmm. right? But if you live in a relativistic world, what difference does it make, right? but only against the more objective truth that there is a God to whom, who is calling us to ultimate glory and that we're going to fall on our face. But the bottom line is he will pick us up. And if we're truly sorry and learn from it with his grace, we can keep going. It's liberating. The objective is liberating. <laughs> it's good news. It's gospel. Yeah. Right. We, 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 we are sinners. What good news? It's our fault. That's good news. We're agents, not just patients. Right. We oh, have fault. Right. Yes. Oh, happy fault. Oh, necessary sin of Adam. 
what a good that that could be a whole retreat just on that on that proclamation well, it's, it's, it's very simple really uh love has to be free and god is love so god freely creates us in his image and we have the freedom to goof very badly and to reject him uh and thus all of history goes down the drain why because of god's love two apparently supreme triumphs of satan the garden of eden to uh, get, get us all and on calvary to kill god himself or god's supreme triumph right because that fall brought about the whole drama of human history which is our redemption which right. in the end is a glory that dwarfs all the darkness that it replaced us and this worst thing in history that ever happened namely the deliberate torture and murder of god almighty uh we celebrate on a holiday we call good friday our salvation oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah absolutely absolutely at least interesting anybody who says christianity is a bunch of planets who has never looked at it it may yeah. be crazy but it's, it's fascinating absolutely absolutely now i have another topic i wanted to just raise quickly from from your perspective as a philosopher apologist theologian um talk to me about and i because i've spoken about it often but i want you to to give your perspective that is tell me what is the role of beauty in the philosophical enterprise in the theological enterprise in life human life what's it, its importance its role we all want truth goodness and beauty without limit uh we may want to be we may want to deceive but nobody wants to be deceived we may not want to be good ourselves but we want good things for us uh, and we we may not be very beautiful but we're not satisfied with ugliness mm -hmm. uh, beauty is the first thing that we notice beauty is the ambassador of truth and goodness beauty is the point of the arrow that first enters the bullseye so if if a truth is presented in an ugly way, it's going to be rejected. And if goodness is presented in a, a ugly way, it's going to be rejected. And that's not just an aesthetic icing on the cake or, or clothing or covering up. That's the revealing of, of the inner nature. Thus, Mother Teresa, because of all her wrinkles, is more beautiful than a, a shallow movie star. Mm -hmm. That spiritual beauty can still be detected kind of beauty that's deceptive and vain, the kind you uh, you get by by covering things up and, and, and making up uh, excuses. But uh, but there's a deeper kind of beauty that is, uh, well, I, I remember when I was about 16 years old, very little about Catholicism, uh, and I was just bored, so I bought a book by St. John of the Cross called The Ascent of Mount Carmel. I didn't understand it at all, but it was so beautiful that I said, there must be some truth and goodness here. I don't understand. Now, that's like Everest. It was not just the aesthetic beauty, not just the words, not just the good poetry, but the beauty of that ideal, that value, that uh, uh, that goodness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it says beauty is, beauty is simply the same thing as goodness only received in a different way. Yeah, it's interesting. Is it true that it, for the Greeks, right, um, and for the ancient philosophers, beauty was also order and proportion? And is that... There's a is, word in Greek, tokalon, A-A-L-O-N in English, means the good and the beautiful. And it implies uh, right order. They, they, they took joy in, in seeing right order. And misery and disorder. And we still do, especially with our lives. When our lives are disordered and falling apart and ugly, that's that's a kind of death. Right. Our souls can can sort of anticipate what's going to happen to our body when, when it, it simply falls apart and, and order does not reign. Yeah, you know what's interesting? I remember in, in college, which is, you know, my Jurassic period of my life, The uh, I remember that there was... A real dis we had this real heated discussion about what makes a face beautiful. And mm -hmm. the only thing everyone could agree on is that it's proportional, hmm. that nothing's out of order. Yep. And people are drawn to what's proportional, what's, what's, and I think to myself, to, to you, because there's an objectivity to it, right? Beauty is not just subjective in that sense, right? Yes, yes. And that's why we see the faces in, in a modern artist like Picasso as deliberately ugly. Now, maybe Picasso is just a fake, and maybe he's uh, uh, 
just trying to show beauty by contrast with ugliness, but it seems that he's, he's deliberately cultivating ugliness. When you go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, and you, you better not have any weapons of, of destruction there, because if you take that stuff seriously, you're going to be tempted to commit suicide. The exaltation of ugliness and a fear of beauty. I'm told by a number of our architects that it's impossible to get uh, uh, a lot of support for anything beautiful in, in architecture nowadays. It, it has to be off center. It has to be transgressive. It has to be unnatural rather than that. Uh, and order works. and harmony of fortune are enemies rather than allies. Well, because they may question the fundamental premise we started with, and that is, if there is an order and you find it attractive, then the idea that you are the author of what that order should be is not true. Yeah, yeah. Right? You can create disorder, you can't create order, you can only discover it. So it takes humility. Right, right. So it, it's funny, here in the diocese, Steve and I have been talking about this, chatting about this for the last year or so, it, it's we're 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 in, uh, embarking on this audacious enterprise, not a program or initiative. I call it the one. It's the one object. It's the one priority. We're using truth, beauty, and goodness. Our task is to provide opportunities in ordinary and extraordinary life for people to encounter the presence, the mercy, the love, the power, the grace of Christ, and to give them communities that walk with them, that accompany them in that exploration. This is exactly the philosophy of uh, uh, Word on Fire, Bishop Barron's organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's spectacularly successful. Right. And simple. In yes. a sense. Yes. Commonsensical. Natural. Yeah. Human. Right. 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 Well, listen, we're, almost, we're running out of time. Anything else on your mind you want up to our, our listeners to hear? or? Well, if you're going to read the saints, read the, the older ones. If you're going to read philosophers, read the modern ones. You're going to read books, read the old books. Uh, I'd rather read the Bible twice than read the Bible once and a hundred commentary. Uh, well said. Thank you. Thank you. It was true. It was great to chat with you. I, I'm so delighted that you you found the time for, to to come on the podcast. I and I just want to I want to thank you for all your work and everything you've done. And I will continue to pray for you. Right. Thank that you, Bishop Frank, and through. thank you, thank you for living up to your name. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I want to. You, you should talk to my confessor, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also want to make a, a pitch. That conversation was so fascinating. We didn't get around to it, but uh, Dr. Kreist has just released a brand new book set called Socrates' Children, which, after having taught college philosophy for 60 years, uh, I, I know, Dr. Kreist, you, you were looking for a beginner's philosophy text that was clear, accessible, and enjoyable, but you couldn't find anything out there. So you decided to write it yourself. So that's that's why I write books. I want to read them first, but I sometimes <laughs> have to write them before I read them. <laughs> so before we go to break, I'll just make a pitch. Uh, look for Socrates Children by Dr. Peter Kraft. You can buy it wherever you get your books, or may I suggest that you go to wordonfire.org. Um, we're going to be back with a listener question. This is very, uh, this is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. And uh, see you in a second. Hey, it's Matt from Restless on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network. Each week on Restless, we young adults restlessly seek the face of Christ in today's crazy and mixed up world. Join us each Friday at noon on 1350 AM, 103.9 FM, the Veritas app, or wherever you get your shows. Hope to see you there. All right, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. All right, Excellency. Here is this week's listener question. It says, I'd like to know what Bishop Caggiano thinks about the possible Eucharistic miracle in Connecticut. And has the bishop ever experienced any Eucharistic miracles? Well, the second part of the question is, no, I have not experienced one directly. I mean, there are many that are out there. And some of the most compelling presentations I've been to in a while are those that, that show the variety and depth and breadth of the Eucharistic miracles that we have seen, right? But for Connecticut, I would just say this. I believe it is possible. I believe it demands a true investigation, which I believe Archbishop Blair and the Archdiocese are doing. But I would say I would not be surprised in the least if it were true, in part because it is my understanding that Blessed McGivney was associated with that parish was either his first or last assignment. 
And I would be thrilled if that Eucharistic miracle was the second miracle that got the church to recognize Father McGivney as a saint. So I think it's on the unfolding of the economy of grace that that may be in our midst. That would be cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you, oh, you experience a Eucharistic miracle every mass, by of the course. way, but of course. that's I, not what I the listener meant. <laughs> I take that for granted because I believe what the Lord says. <laughs> right. right. All right. So if you have a question for Bishop Frank, send it in on social media. Or you can email questions at veritascatholic.com. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So is Veritas Catholic Network. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Foundations in Faith. A grant from the St. Therese Fund for Evangelization makes it possible for us to bring Let Me Be Frank to you. Foundations in Faith is committed to supporting and transforming pastoral ministries in the Diocese of Bridgeport. And you can learn more about their outstanding work at foundationsinfaith.org. And you can buy the box set, Socrates Children by Peter Kreeft, wherever you get your books or at wordonfire.org. Dr. Craig, thank you so much for a fascinating hour. Thank you. It was a great opportunity and a great joy for me to do. God bless you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. And as I said, you will be in my prayers. Please pray for me too. <laughs> so let's pray. Shall we? In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In Easter joy, we give you thanks, Father, for the gift of of redemption and salvation in your son, whose love was demonstrated to us and to the world in his free gift on the cross and in his glorious triumph, triumph over sin and death. May we be faithful ambassadors of this word of salvation as we ask your spirit to bless us, all those who are listening to us and all those whom we love. We make our prayer as we ask all things through Christ our Lord, amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, Excellency. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Peter.